Okay. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody. You are here at Port of Portland's community listening session on the Skyward Lease. And we really appreciate your participation today. Uh, my name is Sylvia Chiborowski and I'm a facilitator with Kearns and West and I'll just be helping to facilitate the conversation today and uh, make sure that we have a space where folks can make their comments heard and participate in the conversation. And I'm just going to spend a few minutes going over our agenda and some meeting logistics before we really begin and kick it off. And before we get started, we know that a lot, some of you are still being led into the meeting, but we hope that, that most everyone who wants to be here is here. And Elizabeth Kennedy Wong at the Port of Portland is just going to put a survey link into the meeting chat. So if you open up your um, meeting chat box, which is just kind of a bubble, a conversation bubble icon, and open that up, you'll see a link to a Google form where we just want to hear kind of what interested you in this meeting, why are you here, just a little bit about you so that we can get a sense of who's in the room since we can't be in an actual space together. So it'll just be helpful for the port and for Skyward going forward. And with that, I'm just going to review our agenda for the day. Um, so today in a second, I'll just give us a little bit of a technology orientation and then we'll get some introductions from the Port of Portland team and the Skyward team. And then just a brief overview from the port and from Skyward on what this process is and just um, answering some, some key questions that have been um, asked over, over the past few weeks about the project. And then we'll get into community discussion. And really, that is the main purpose of today. This is really a place where uh, Skyward and the port would like to provide some information um, on what's happening. But really, it's a space to allow for the community to discuss, provide your feedback, um, raise your issues and concerns, and really create a space for dialogue and discussion. And then we'll just review some next steps at the very end of the meeting. And the meetings from six until eight. So really most of this will be devoted to community discussion. And before we kind of get into it, just some webinar tips and protocols. You've probably all become webinar uh, gurus over the past months with COVID and our new reality. But in case Teams is new to you, we just ask, hopefully you have joined the computer audio and are um, able to speak and, and we'll address microphone issues later if we need to. We ask that you stay on mute when not speaking, um, and that goes for sort of uh, the staff and, and participants as well, just to reduce background noise. And if possible, please join us on video, especially when you are making a comment so that we can kind of have that face-to-face -face interaction. And when we get to the comment um, period today, we'll ask you to raise your hand to get in the queue to speak. And there's a little raise hand icon that you should see um, on your computer and that's how you would raise your hand to, to make a comment. And then when it's your turn to speak, I'll call on you and we just ask that you say your name and affiliation if you have one. You know, if you're part of a neighborhood association or um, an organization, it would just be helpful to know that. And we'll also be using the chat to submit comments throughout the meeting. So if you're unable to um, speak due to audio problems or if you just prefer to say something in writing, we encourage you to use chat and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and a reminder too that this meeting is being recorded and there will be a meeting summary uh, following the meeting. And with that, I will stop this slideshow. And I lost the screen to do that. Here it is. Okay. Um, I'm going to hand it over now to Scott Kilgo with the Port of Portland for some introductions for from our port team. Hi, uh, thank you, Sylvia. This is Scott. I'm uh, my name's Scott Kilgo. I have uh, worked on the Port's real estate development team for going on 20 years, and um, I am excited to see the turnout tonight. And um, I have been working with uh, Skyward. Uh, on a possible lease that we are here to hear uh, what concerns the community might have. And so I'll pass it over to Elizabeth for introductions. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Kennedy Wong. Um, I um, work on community engagement with the Port of Portland, which means that I um, work to identify how and when the public can be engaged in conversations like tonight. 
um, that help inform the port and help us with how we do our work. Um, I will encourage people again to click on the link to sign in. There's a little survey there that gives us a sense of what you want to be, what you want to talk about tonight, um, and that would be really helpful. And with that, I will pass it off to Emerald. Hi everyone, I'm Emerald Bogue. I work with the Port of Portland and I work with Elizabeth on our community affairs team. I also handle regional government affairs. So that means I work with partner jurisdictions on a lot of stuff um, around mutual interests. Hi, I'm glad you're here. There you go. I, I will go. <laughs> Hey, good, good evening, everyone. I'm Teresa Carr, and my role at the port is to lead and manage a group of um, super talented folks who focus on business and economic development in real estate. Scott Kilgo is part of my team. Glad to be here. Thanks. And I'm Nathan Orff. I'm an assistant general counsel with the Port of Portland, and I provide legal support to the business and property folks and in, am involved in drafting agreements. All right, thank you, um, port team members. And I'll turn it over to the Skyward team to in make a few introductions as well. So first, Mariah Scott. Hi, good evening. I'm Mariah Scott. I'm the president of Skyward. And uh, while we are owned by Verizon, we operate as our own business. I've actually been with the company since we were a little startup uh, here in Portland. And we were acquired by Verizon about three and a half years ago, and I became president. I've been in Portland for 25 years and been in tech my whole career. Um, and I just want to start by not only thanking everyone for coming tonight, by just saying up front, uh, let me apologize to the community for the length of time that it has taken us to really uh, understand how best to, to engage and to listen. Um, we're a software company, and so we're we're new to this, and uh, we care very much about being uh, part of the community and understanding and addressing concerns. and And uh, we're here in good faith tonight uh, to listen and to answer those questions, and uh, to try to try to really be a good partner for economic development in North Portland. We will be scheduling additional listening sessions after tonight. Um, we'll have two to three, maybe a few more uh, listening sessions over the next uh, several weeks, and we'll put uh, links to that on our website. Um, we will also, if you give us your contact info, be happy to reach out to you and make sure you have all the information about um, when those listening sessions will be and the opportunity to participate. Thank you. And uh, Jess. Hi everyone, I'm Jess Moody, uh, Director of Marketing and Communications for Skyward. Um, I've been with the company for about six years um, and um, really have loved aviation for my entire life. That's what got me um, into drones and, and drew me into this industry. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from all of you tonight. Um, we're gonna put links to our community page, our resource information page here, um, as well as um, kind of our inbox for any questions about this site and this project and i encourage you to to send those in reach into that you'll be contacting me um so hope it's good to put a face to a name and i look forward to hearing from you all and thank x if you want to take it away hi thanks jess uh yeah uh, i'm x that's uh, that's actually my my full legal name uh, i lead the aviation development center's project for skyward to include uh this proposed project as well as the overall flight program management for skyward uh, for this engagement, my areas of expertise are aviation safety, operations management, and regulatory compliance. Uh, and I think with that, uh, Alex, I think you're up next. Hi, thank you. Hopefully I'm coming through on video here. Uh, my name is Alex Loip, and I am with Verizon. I'm not with Skyward. Uh, I've been with Verizon for about three years. Uh, I work normally on public policy issues involving uh, Verizon's core business, uh, you know, uh, connectivity, wireless and wireline networks. Uh, but I'm here tonight to support uh, the Skyward folks and look forward to speaking with you. Thank you. Thanks, Alex, and thanks to the rest of the Skyward team. 
Um, and this is Sylvie Chibrowski again, helping with facilitation. And uh, just briefly, we're going to kind of give an overview of who we have here. So it looks like we have 46 participants, at least in this meeting. So thank you everyone for participating. Um, and Elizabeth did send out a link to the survey. So I'm going to turn it to her to see if there's anything that came through the survey that you want to um, kind of briefly go over here. Perfect. So we haven't received responses from everyone, but if folks do want to participate, um, if you go into the kind of sh show conversation piece of the Microsoft Teams platform, you can find a link to this survey that's up here. So, so far we've asked, you know, why are you interested in tonight's listening session? Kind of interested in all of these topics. So um, I think we can kind of talk through um, a lot of this and we appreciate you providing that information. And also, um, on the survey link, we'll, we're asking for your email address and your name just so that you can continue to receive information about the effort moving forward. So this is really the best way to stay informed is by providing your um, information through this through the survey link here. Thank you, Sylvia. And somebody did ask in the chat whether or not um, we would share their information. I will not share your contact information except between um, Skyward and the port. But um, you are participating in a public meeting, so um, that is part of the public record. Thanks for that clarification, Elizabeth. So I'm going to get rid of the screen. Great. Thank there you. you. OK, and then in a second, we're going to get into just an overview from the port and from Skyward. And before we get there, just a reminder that really the goal of today's meeting is um, to hear from the community and to work with the community and to understand your concerns and needs um, and provide kind of a level playing field of information um, and make sure that kind of the key pieces of information are able to be shared and to provide that project status um, and really to begin to build just the relationship between um, the port skyward and community on this effort as as it moves forward. And as we get into this, this discussion, just a couple of meeting guidelines for tonight's meeting. We just ask that uh, when we get into our comment period, you know, you provide a balance of speaking time. Um, we know that there are a lot of opinions and um, important perspectives out there, and we want to hear from as many of you as possible. And this is hopefully an opportunity to listen to one another and really ask questions to clarify and respect each other's points of views, values, and interests. We know there's a lot of um, different perspectives. And we also just hope that you focus your comments on ideas and issues and kind of the substance rather than the people in the room, because that's good. That's going to be what's most helpful um, in this process. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Scott Kilgo with the Port of Portland to give an overview of um, the role of the port and the program. Thank you very much, Sylvia. Uh, I know we've had quite a few people join, so um, just uh, to catch you all up. Um, my name's Scott Kilgo. I work in the real estate uh, real estate and commercial team with the Port of Portland for about the last 20 years. And I'd like to give just um, a, a, a brief uh, orientation on what the, the port's role is and then a background on um, our discussions with Skyward uh, that got us to this point today. So, um, and, and also thank you uh, for your commitment to our community and for joining us tonight. And um, please do use the, um, the survey in the chat because that is really how we can make sure we have uh, a connection and get uh, to address all the right questions or the questions that you are bringing or the comments. So, um, and we also want to be clear uh, with you tonight that uh, from the port's perspective, no decisions have been made. We, we are taking tonight as a serious listening opportunity so that we make sure we understand uh, what concerns the community has so we can uh, understand those and make an informed decision on any path uh, forward. So a little bit of background on the port and its mission. Uh, basically, our mission is to enhance the region's economy and quality of life by providing efficient cargo and air passenger access to national and global markets and by promoting industrial development. And uh, the Skyward uh, potential lease is under that last section of potential development. We have land and we develop it hopefully with strategic partners 
uh, to achieve uh, the port's financial, economic uh, development and social equity goals um, in, in realizing our mission. So that's kind of a, a, a brief summary of, of our role. So let's talk about how we got here as far as how does Skyward fit into that. And I wanna make sure, I'm gonna do maybe a little bit more reading just because I wanna make sure I get, uh, track all the information. So the real estate broker representing Skyward contacted the port real estate team to ask about properties um, on the waterfront that would be good for a potential industrial use in September of 2019. Uh, about a month later in October, we had a tour uh, of the property um, with their broker. And uh, shortly thereafter, we were asked, the Port of Portland was asked to enter what's called a non-disclosure agreement. And uh, that was when um, uh, exploratory conversations started for discussing a potential lease. Now, a non-disclosure agreement is, is simply a document that two parties agree not to disclose uh, information that they're discussing until later in a negotiation, like for a lease or a contract. That uh, non-disclosure agreement is still in place today. Um, and uh, during exploratory conversations, though, even with the NDA, uh, the port did encourage Skyward to engage with the city on some other exploratory um, processes that did include some public uh, public comment periods, which uh, led to some of the comments that brought uh, our attention to some concerns in the community. Skyward also, um, uh, at, uh, we also ask or encourage Skyward to participate in a community meeting that uh, we were made aware of, which they did. Um, and so basically, uh, we are, as part of the exploratory process, um, we have, we, we came to the decision that we should have our own listening meeting, uh, building on that public uh, comment period out of the city, the, uh, the neighborhood association meeting that was attended, we felt uh, tonight's meeting was a good next step. And so that brought us to where we are today. And as I said um, at, my, at the outset, uh, no decisions had been made. And we look forward to hearing your comments, concerns, and questions um, so that we can make informed decisions moving forward. So um, with that, um, oh, I have one more comment, actually. Uh, we, have, we are hopeful that this opportunity uh, with Skyward, uh, that Skyward proposes would bring a new quality job, uh, new quality jobs to the region um, without impact uh, often, often associated with industrial development. Um, so we thought that Scott, the Skyward use would be a good uh, a good use for the property, um, but certainly look forward to your comments. With that, I'd like to pass it over to Mariah. Great. Thanks, Scott. So I, I want to give a little bit of background of, on who Skyward is, what our company is about, uh, and what we're, we are proposing uh, for this uh, testing facility. So Skyward at its heart is a software company and we uh, were started in 2012 uh, in Portland. Our headquarters are downtown in Portland and always have been. And we are really committed to staying and growing in the community uh, and always have been. Uh, we also have always been about drones for good. This is one of our first uh, campaigns was actually a drones for good campaign because we believe in helping companies use drones to do jobs that we often talk about being dull or dirty or dangerous, and that those are jobs that drones can do, uh, help keep people safe and get us better data from the aerial perspective. So what does that mean? We provide software and training and consulting to help companies use drones. Uh, and those uses might look like things like uh, construction, industrial inspection. So that's things like using a drone to inspect a roof or a bridge or a cell phone tower or power lines, using drones to survey land, using drones for disaster response. Uh, and our customers use our software to help manage their drone programs specifically in order to fly safely and to fly uh, in compliance with rules and regulations. Uh, so it's a... Um, it's a very operational part of the market that we operate in, but we're very committed to aviation safety and to taking the same culture of safety found in piloted aircraft and bringing that forward to the drone world and helping companies understand how to safely adopt the technology. With the testing facility site that we're proposing in North Portland, I'd like to be very clear 
This site is not part of a military partnership. It is not used by the military. We are not testing military drones there, nor will we be testing any facial recognition software or any surveillance use cases. It's not part of our business. It's not part of who we are as a company. Um, what this testing facility will be used for is validating and testing software and systems integrations so that we're able to help our customers, companies, use drones more efficiently. So what that might look like is connecting drones to Verizon's uh, wireless network to support long range flight so that we can quickly share data back to first responders and to field technicians when we're supporting critical infrastructure. Uh, during the wildfires, we used drones to go places where people could not safely go and to be able to send that data back to crews so they could understand what was happening inside an evacuation zone, for example. We'll also be testing remote identification of drones. So that is like a digital license plate on a drone that lets public agencies identify whether the drone is allowed to be in the sky, whether that person is actually registered and licensed to operate the drone. It's a really key building block that we, we're committed to. We'll also be testing Skyward's drone airspace map, which is a map that helps operators automatically comply with airspace regulations. So it helps them know where it's safe to fly and be able to safely integrate in the national airspace. Um, so I'm happy to talk more uh, about what Skyward does. Uh, we've been able to really help companies do some wonderful things with the technology. We're excited about bringing those jobs to Portland uh, and about the potential, the positive potential um, for the technology in our lives. Thank you, Mariah, and thank you, Scott, for that background. And Scott, did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, I was just going to say, it looks like Matt, uh, one of the guests, has his, his hand up. Yes, perfect. And I think we'll get to that in just a second. So yeah, but thank you, Mariah and Scott. And we'll move into our discussion now. And before we do that, we just want to do some logistical reminders and um, help make sure that the next hour and a half goes smoothly. So just a reminder to stay on mute when you're not speaking to reduce background noise. And we'll, meet you, we'll mute you if, if needed, if we're hearing a lot of background noise. Um, and we'll ask you to raise your hand to get in the queue to speak. So that's just the little raise hand icon um, on your app here. And you can go ahead and raise your hand at this point if you, if you know you have a comment you wanna make. And when um, it's your turn, we'll just call on folks in the queue and we just ask that you say your name and affiliation and turn on your video if you feel comfortable doing so. It's always helpful to um, see folks since we can't be in the room together. You're also welcome to use the chat to submit comments. So that's the little comment bubble icon. And um, Elizabeth will be monitoring the chat. We're probably not gonna say everything that's in the chat out loud, but if there are some questions come up that seem like it would be worth answering in the larger group, um, we might point to those. And um, the chat will also be become part of kind of the meeting summary that'll be developed after today's meeting. So know that if you put your comments in writing there, they'll definitely be captured going forward. And just a reminder, the purpose of this discussion really is to hear your issues and concerns um, and you know any ideas you have for solutions and all of the kind of community knowledge and information that you can share to help shape the path forward is incredibly useful at this point, um, particularly any kind of focus on solutions and ideas to benefit the broader community and the broader needs. Uh, and the port also talked about its mandate to promote economic development in the region. So, you know, it's important to the port to understand how does the community see that the agency can best meet that mandate while also balancing community interests. Um, so, you know, the port and Skyward are here to listen to your input and also to provide answers to key questions. Might not be able to respond to every question, especially ones that are more technical in nature or that need more detailed responses but the meeting summary after today will provide um, answers to some of those more specific questions. And there is also information available on Skyward's website. And I think Elizabeth will also be putting that link in the chat so that you can go there for kind of some frequently asked questions um, and answers to your questions. 
So I put that link in the chat already and the sign in is also still there. I keep I repost it periodically. Um, for folks to go ahead and sign in as well. Perfect. Thanks, Elizabeth. OK, so I see three hands up, so we'll take those in order. Um, Matt and and apologies in advance if I uh, mispronounce your name, but Matt, Hugh and then uh, Toma. So Matt, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Matt, you got it correctly. It's, it's perfectly pronounced. Um, so a couple of questions uh, um, just to, on the process, I guess. Well, first, um, I would we would love to hear how Skyward is has any kind of autonomy from Verizon. How 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 is Skyward um, not going to be able? How are they going to be able to resist uh, Verizon? Whatever they want to do, they're they're already working with the military down in Southern California to to test and, and develop this exact technology how and how on earth can you possibly tell them no uh, that they can't do that here and secondly um, when it comes to um, just the ports process and as I understand there was an NDA but uh, to this you how there's no way that you could have looked at this and thought that this would not be controversial and and that the community would have, want to have some sort of input on this and how was it just decided that there was going to be no outreach whatsoever until we found out about it through the city permitting process. That's a good place to start. Thank you. OK, thanks, Matt. So maybe first to Scott to kind of talk about port process and um, any thoughts on the first question as well or to Mariah for that. So Scott, go ahead. Sure. Um, well, um, thank you for your question, Matt. Um, we we yes, we did have an NDA in place. Um, but our conversations with uh, Skyward were to move through the public processes with the city, and um, that that was where we were when uh, comments came uh, that brought us to today's listing session. Um, uh, if I guess I don't I don't have a lot more to say on that um, uh, because we did even though we were under an NDA. Um, Skyward in, uh, did engage through the normal processes that have public comment. I guess I would leave it at that. Mariah, would you like to speak to um, the Verizon? Yeah, I process? can take the comment. Yeah, absolutely. It's a uh, uh, perfectly natural question. Uh, so Skyward, uh, as I mentioned, uh, is run autonomously. So we are a separate legal entity um, and Verizon as a large public company has has many different entities um, with different levels of autonomy. Uh, we're operated as, a, as an autonomous business unit. Our business is wholly focused on commercial use cases, not military use cases. Um, in fact, the, the group that I'm not, familiar with the group. I have seen the press releases or the articles that others have, have seen, but um, it, it's a it's another operating unit of Verizon and it is not connected with our business, which is wholly focused on these commercial use cases and and always has been. So we're and the plans for the drone testing facility, uh, which X, who's here tonight, um, I'm looking around my Hollywood squares, uh, X, uh, X is leading that facility and has, you know, management oversight of the R&D that we're doing there or the testing that we're doing there. Um, and that is focused on commercial use cases. So X is X military, which we, uh, we appreciate, but no problem. Um, but also, uh, can you show us any way that you can prove that Verizon will not have input on, on your operations, can't require you to do these kinds of testing? Anything, any way you can reassure this community in writing that that won't never that that will never happen here. I think you know what we can tell you is uh, the use cases that we are focused on, Understood. and that and the and you know where our business is, and that this is a bit this is a testing facility that is wholly owned and operated under our direction which is focused on these use cases. There are also uh, drones. Verizon's paying for your legal work here. Verizon's paying for all the work that's being done here. So it's not wholly yes, operating. And, and, <laughs> and, and Verizon is, and I will say with absolute conviction, Verizon is 
um, wholly committed to our mission and to our commercial mission and is, is uh, very aligned and supportive with this commercial uh, focus for the use case and that investment um, for this facility. They, um, we have a no doubt. We have a great alignment there. They are they are very supportive. Alex is on the line. He's been a terrific um, support for us. So um, great. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And Matt, I appreciate you bringing up the concern. And I also want to know, you know, this is kind of the first listening session um, and identifying all the issues is really critical here. And, you know, I know that everyone's probably not going to get answers to all the questions perfectly the way that they would like to hear them. Um, but identifying those issues here and then seeing how they can be addressed going forward through this community process um, will hopefully be a little bit more helpful going forward. And Scott? Yeah, and I, and I would just like to add, um, uh, I'll look for how I can expand and clarify my response in the public process because we, we did have an NDA, but I can probably uh, follow up with Matt on, on uh, some additional clarity that isn't uh, from, from um, just verbal right now. Can I jump in and answer um, the question about the public process? And I would say that the process is happening at the right time for the process to happen. Whenever you start to enter into an agreement, um, you, you want to move forward with a public process when you have a degree of certainty that the project is possible, but before it's final. Um, so you don't start every process with or every project with a conversation with the public about what may or may not be. You have to get to a certain degree of confidence that it is something that can be, but it's not fully banked. And I think that's exactly where we are with this process. And this is why we're taking a beat on the conversation to really give the public the opportunity to say, hey, we have these concerns. We have these questions. You need to talk to us. And that's exactly what we're doing at this moment. Because no final decisions have been made, and I want to make sure that that's clear. Thank you. All right, so next we have um, Hugh or who go ahead and then I see other hands from um, Toma, Mariah Osborne, Willie and Leah. So we'll get to you shortly, but um, Hugh or who go ahead. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> My camera is not working today, but I had a general question for uh, Skywood, and I'm trying to envision the a day out in the future whereby Skywood is now fully functioning um, at that location. How would a typical day look like for the neighbors who live around that vicinity? And if uh, you and if you have mapped the Willamette River to say beyond this premise, we are not going to fly around. And, and you know things like that and yes also, great question yeah go ahead okay could i ask x to take that i think x has um done most of the and leading the facility has the best information about our plans there yeah thank you mariah and thank you hugh um the the majority of these and we we had some of this information and we'll get it back out at the cathedral park neighborhood association uh, the majority of these flights are relatively short. Uh, the, the drones are electric vehicles, really. Uh, they, they're battery powered, so they've got fairly short endurances in terms that they can only fly for limited periods of time. Um, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, so uh, I, I don't want to misrepresent them, but the, the flights are usually an hour to an hour and a half in an eight hour day is what we're seeing currently. A lot of the time that we spend is preparatory time to get the drones prepared for flight. Um, there's a lot of pre-work that happens at partner sites and other places before the drones would even arrive at a place like this facility. Um, the, so on a typical day, that's kind of what we do, start the day to prep, uh, do our checklist, make sure that everything's safe, check the airspace. Uh, you know, we're working on developing uh, procedures uh, for some of the uh, environmental characteristics of the area. Uh, we're looking at uh, at the noise monitoring equipment that we can use to make sure that we're within the city's zoning requirements for noise. Uh, and then then we fly. So yeah, that's kind of in an eight hour day. Usually we do about an hour flying. Uh, part of the, the reason for this site is to be able to fly along the river. Uh, so we anticipate that uh, the majority of the flights will will start and end at the at this facility, but spend most of their time uh, to the to the north. Uh, towards uh, towards uh, 
Yeah. Will you have any night flights? We currently, um, we have a daylight operations waiver, which allows us to fly at night. Uh, that's really not something that we do routinely. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's really not where, where the industry is, is currently. Certainly there's the potential for it, but it's something that's pretty much the exception and not the rule. It requires a special FAA waiver to do a night flight, which has conditions to it. And with that also comes an increased uh, uh, need for noise abatement, drops the, deci the decibel level that's acceptable by, by, to an even lower level. Thank you. And Scott, did you also have a response? No, that uh, X's description is my understanding uh, of, the, uh, of what they could expect in a typical day and how I've been describing it to, to others. Okay, thank you. And thanks, Hugh, for the question. And let's go next to uh, Toma. Hi. Can you hear okay. me okay? We can, yeah, go ahead. And just remind you to say your name and affiliation if you have one, go ahead. Hi, I'm Toma Devers. I'm here with the Braided River Campaign. Um, so I have a question for Mariah. Um, when she sits there and says that Skyward um, um, guarantees that there's not, uh, that this facility, this drone testing is not gonna be used for surveillance or military. Um, I find that very dishonest. Um, because Skyward is um, a subsidiary of Verizon. Verizon is um, one of the biggest corporations on the planet. No one's ever heard of Skyward. So obviously it's Verizon that's in charge here. Um, so uh, recently, and I, I, don't, I don't know what kind of planet everyone's on, but um, there's a lot of distrust with Verizon. Um, our own um, Senator Wyden recently called Verizon out um, due to the fact that Verizon keeps on selling third parties um, customers data, including their locations. So why on God's earth should we trust a company that wants to build a Verizon drone facility on our river when it has so little disregard for our safety and our security and our privacy. If you are ignoring the history of Verizon, let's just say people are not gonna take you seriously. So Maria, Mariah, I'd like you to stop claiming that we can, you can guarantee us that this Skyward facility will, you can guarantee it won't be used for surveillance or military because looking at Verizon's history, we see a different scenario entirely. Um, also, I'm very alarmed by the lack of transparency regarding the city. I have two questions. Um, one is um, last month, with the um, City of Portland Bureau of Planning and um, Sustainability. It was the third Tuesday of the month of last month and I asked them, what do you know about the proposed drone facility? And I was told by Tom Armstrong that he had just found out that morning. Does that sound realistic to you? Did the City of Portland Bureau of Planning and Sustainability just find out about this a month ago? So I'd like um, someone to explain that to me. Um, how, how does that, how does that, that doesn't make sense to me. Um, so I'd like someone to answer that question. And then my third question is, um, when was the first email sent to the community regarding any testimony period? I'd like to know when the first notification first came out for the first notification for any testimony period or listening session. And in, fin in closing, I would like to add that it's got to be a little bit embarrassing that we're having a listening session when the week that the permits are um, uh, expected. So um, but again, um, you might work on uh, your uh, transparency because the trust issue is like um, kind of astronomical at this point. And this drone facility is not something that Portlanders want. Thank you, Toma. Um, really appreciate those questions and perspectives. And I think I heard three main things. 
One is just really wanting more assurance that this site won't be used for military purposes and maybe Skyward or the port can speak to that and also heard um, concern that the Bureau of uh, BES or the city of Portland just found out about this program about a month ago and wondering about about that. And then um, also wanting to get better clarity about when the community heard that they could provide their comments um, on this program. So Scott, do you want to start um, and then see if, if Mariah or others want to add to that? Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. There you go. Um, yes, the, the second and third question about city process. We don't have anybody here on the city. Um, uh, I can tell you that um, I know uh, well be before the uh, a month ago, Verizon was engaged in uh, early assistance discussions with the city. So the process started earlier, but we will um, we will get back uh, to well, our follow up will be on the timing of the two questions that you've asked with, regarding the city process. But we we don't uh, have a city representative to address that. Um, so we can get back on those two. Mariah, do you want to talk on the first? Can I can I maybe jump in and differentiate a couple of processes that are happening simultaneously, if, if that's helpful? Sure. Um, so so the port is working on the lease process with um, Skyward. Skyward is working on a permitting process with the city of Portland, um, and those two different processes don't necessarily intersect to the, as I understand it. Um, so there's a relationship between Skyward and the city of Portland, and there's a relationship between um, Skyward and the port of Portland that are that are somewhat different. So, uh, so uh, yeah, that that answers um, that provides a little bit of information, but it still doesn't uh, explain why the Portland Bureau of Planning and Sustainability claims that they had no idea about this drone facility a month ago. I can help a little bit with that. Hi, I'm Emerald and I work for the port and in government affairs. Um, with the city, this would rest more actually in the Bureau of Development Services and less in the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. I can't speak for the city, but I, I know that if you get in touch with BPS and BDS, they are likely to tell you the same thing, that BPS is sort of where the codes are written and BDS is where the codes are carried out. And that's where this, that's where this permitting conversation sits, if that helps at all. Yeah, and it, and it also sounds like there might not be in the right people in the room right now to really address your question, Toma, um, seeing as how we don't have folks from the city represented here. Well, there are um, port commissioners. So if, if the port commissioners can tell me there is no, there is no information we shared with the city of Portland planning and sustainability department. I mean, was there any communication? Was there any like, discussion so to clarify there's there's actually no port commissioners on i'm looking at the list um we're port staff um but we're on uh no when we're under nda that the rule is that we we don't talk about it um and we leave it, it when we're in that lease discussion that lease discussion is between us and the potential tenant and then it is on the tenant to navigate the permitting process. Again, the permitting process isn't with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, it's with the Bureau of Development Services. So there wouldn't be a process where we notify the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability of this. We do have a close relationship with the city of Portland and we definitely coordinate with BPS on a lot of stuff, but this just this isn't something that we, that this is not part of our relationship where that would be required or, ne or even necessary. So, so maybe maybe the answer to the question would be to let Skyward talk about what they have done regarding the permitting process. So actually, let, can you describe the NDA first? We haven't been told about any NDA. Sure, I can I can uh, I can uh, cover that. Um, 
uh, earlier in my introduction, Toma, I, I, um, in how we got here, we entered a non-disclosure agreement um, early uh, before we entered specific discussions with Skyward. Um, uh, that NDA bound us, uh, or basically we that's where two parties agreed not to discuss until later in the negotiation uh, what they're talking about. And it was during those exploratory conversations uh, about a potential lease, which is where we still are talking about a potential lease, not having a recommendation for a lease to move forward, that Skyward engaged with the city for the, uh, the appropriate and typical permitting processes, uh, an early assist process and other processes uh, with regard to land use to engage with the city to basically work through the public city processes. So that's. So, so um, it appears to me that the lack of transparency came from this non-disclosure agreement that the city of Portland has with Skyward, a Verizon company. So um, I'm just a little bit confused. So how is the public supposed to trust anything that you say at this point? I mean, this is a very, this is seven acres. It's on our river that some of us find sacred. We're finding out about this just a couple weeks ago. There's permits due. You're, you're, you're sitting here. The city said that they had no idea about it a month ago. Skyward's been in town since 2012. And um, you're, you're sitting, just going to sit there and say that this non-disclosure agreement is completely acceptable. Because I already stated that the public has no faith in Verizon, right? And frankly, given Ted Wheeler's, like, uh, the way he's running the city, most people don't have any faith in the city leadership. So um, that kind of just, this NDA is really um, kind, of, kind of problematic. And it says a lot about the city's lack of transparency regarding a very uh, sensitive uh, project. So I just don't understand how there's any legal support for this NDA because this is falls within the Greenway, uh, Willamette Greenway project and um, thereby the community is allowed to have input. Thereby, I think this NDA is illegal and I think there should be a full investigation because there's no way that Verizon should be able to have a secret arrangement with the city of Portland regarding riverfront property, prized riverfront property. And also um, the third part of my question was to ask um, the Port of Portland, when was the community first notified about this drone facility and in what form were they notified? And so Scott or Elizabeth, if you have any response to that, go ahead. And then I think we'll move into some of the other hands that we have up. Yeah, um, I, th I, so much. I think we want to give Skyward a little bit of an opportunity to talk about what they have done, because as I said before, the permitting process is be between Skyward and the city of Portland. Um, and so if they could talk through what they have done regarding that, I think that would be helpful. I just wanted that third question, just the date that the community was notified about this project. It's critical. And verification. So, and Scott, Elizabeth, if you have an answer to that, and if not, maybe that's something we get back to, to folks about afterwards. I think that can be part of our follow-up. And Mariah? We'll need to so follow up on the, oh, sorry, Mariah. Uh, this is ahead, Jess, Jess, also from Skyward. Uh, we'll also need to include in the follow-up materials um, kind of our, our process for permitting as we don't have the kind of two subject matter experts for that on the line today. I, I, in respect to the, to the question, I'd like to be uh, as specific as we can be in our responses. So I would prefer not to give a general answer, but to talk to the, Two folks on the team who've actually been the ones doing the permitting and make sure that we can provide you with the dates and the specifics around the process and how we engaged. Thank you. And thank you, Toma. 
Um, let's see, let's go to Mariah Osborne and then Willie. So Mariah, go ahead. Thank you. I'm Mariah Osborne. Uh, I'm a member of Portland Raging Grannies, but I don't represent them. Um, but this is how I found out about this. I just am one technical um, item. I'm on a Mac and I don't have a chat button. So there's no way that I can get any information that you're giving in the chat. Um, my question is, I'm just wondering where this idea that these were military drones originated. Um, I, I can tell you that uh, in all honesty and good faith, I am as confused as you are. Uh, our, our, our company has always from the very beginning been focused on commercial use cases and not engaged in uh, military drone testing or military partnerships. And, and this site is, is not, does not have that purpose, uh, is not testing facial recognition or surveillance. Um, we frankly um, were, were also uh, um, uh, confused to see that information come out there. And one of the reasons why I, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity tonight to talk about who we are and the types of drones and use cases we do work with. Okay, that's reassuring. Thank you. But Verizon is engaged in those activities. Great. Yes, thanks for that context, Matt. Um, okay, and let's go to Willie and then Leah. So Willie, go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks again to the port and Skyward for having the listening session tonight. Um, I uh, I'm with Human Access Project of my organization. Our mission is to transform Portland's relationship with the Willamette River. And the context of us being involved is we are part of the Portland Harbor Community Coalition and we're here to uh, support North Portland. Um, we have a long standing relationship with the Port of Portland. Uh, we consider them friends. Um, in this case, I, I have some, I'm surprised at the way this was handled. So I'm gonna flip over because I made some notes on my um, face won't appear, but I also would like to thank Mariah for coming. Um, that represents how important this is to Skyward that you're taking the time to participate. And I, it's also important to me that you're actually a resident of Portland um, as opposed to a, a company that's out of town. So going back to Matt's comment, um, you know, this group was really caught on its heels. Um, there may be a non-disclosure agreement but at the point that the public process went out to notify the neighbors, that was certainly an opportunity to communicate this project more broadly. It is true that to the letter of law, it may have been followed, but in the spirit of serving the community, this was, it's, it, it's hard not to feel like this was something that was tried to be slid under the table. Point number one, so my recommendation to the port Port of Portland, I understand you guys are under extreme pressure for revenue right now, and you're trying to lease your properties. Um, but I think it's really important for Port of Portland to understand that if not the case going forward, Portland Harbor Community Coalition and the neighbors of North Portland are keeping a very close eye on all activities of the Port of Portland and who these neighbors are gonna be. So earlier in the process to engage the community would um, smooth the process. That's point number one. Um, Point number two, um, Port of Portland's um, equity statement. This clearly disproportionately affects uh, the community of North Portland. I just kind of put it out there, not for a specific answer, but something to consider is if this drone testing facility was proposed in downtown Portland, if it was uh, proposed uh, further west, bordering Lake Oswego, how would that be handled? I don't think people like, it's a quality of life issue. People do not like having drones flying around when they're trying to escape our built environment. That's why we need our river so much is to be able to escape our built environment. So having drones, uh, this is a very serious quality of life issue. In the land use application, which is pending and not approved yet, um, which we are going to be making um, some input on, and we've also reached out to Commissioner Hardesty's office uh, there's an argument that this is a river-related use. 
in my research, I found that most drone research facilities that I found are on private land um, that is acreage. I'm just this, I would actually like a question, an answer to. Are there any other drone testing facilities that you are aware of internationally that um, specifically test over water? I don't really like the precedent this is setting um, for that regard as well. Um, this is a high density area. There is uh, a lot of people who rent, um, they aren't homeowners. Again, this is an example of a contradictions with the port's uh, equity policy. Um, and again, I would I really appreciate the fact that the port made the point to express that this lease is not finalized yet, which implicitly implies that the port is interested in the feedback of the community that they serve. Um, there are maker spaces uh, adjacent to this site. Matt is one. There's many other makers. I know Curtis um, loves maker spaces. Um, this is impacting the quality of the experience of these makers that are on the river. Um, and, you know, I would say again, I think Matt makes a really good point. Um, Mariah, you've expressed your independence from Verizon. I, I would say um, at this point, you know, just like the Port of Portland says that this lease is not final and they're, you know, contemplating this. I will say myself, you know, I'm in, inclined to uh, side with the really strong feelings of uh, the rest of the coalition, uh, but certainly putting something in writing that there will not be any military drone testing would satisfy this um, issue that people have. And just to circle back again, I think that potentially the tone of a lot of the residents um, and other nonprofits, uh, community organizations are expressing is a fear that this is something that's being pushed through um, and this could have been very largely mitigated if there was an earnest public outreach process at the point um, the land use application was filed in May. Um, so I guess the only question really that's out there is um, whether or not there's any other drone testing facilities that are uh, that conduct routine flights over a river as part of their operations. Thank you again, everybody for coming and Mariah and the port. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, let me just, uh, I wanted to say a, a couple points on that and then I'm gonna turn over to, to um, X. Um, I, I, uh, I agree with you on the community engagement. And I think one of the things that we have been discussing uh, in the in the you know the days or the week before this meeting is really our own reflection on um, how we might have responded more proactively and sooner and better in engaging the community. And I will I, the only thing I can say to that is we're a software company. We are not accustomed to how and when we should be doing these kinds of community outreach. It's it's new to us, and I think that we were we uh, are learning that uh, we should have been engaging sooner and more proactively. And we um, we're trying to make up for that tonight. Lie, in terms of saying we're here and listening. Lie, um, lie. Um, I just just want to remind folks that we want to keep this conversation respectful and focus on the issues and and not interrupt others appreciate that thank you willie okay. the, i would like to thank and you I, for I, the comments I, I as well i appreciate that i guess the one the one thing i'd say just to that mariah is just um you know really appreciate that you're here but again it is really hard just you know you were named the executive of the year last year by portland business journal i mean this is a company that's really won well you guys aren't unintelligent you have the financial resources. You have the financial resources to hire the right people to do these things, to anticipate these things. Um, maybe I, the only thing I can be open to potentially, although I mean, being in the drone field, I mean, I, I, you know, for the events that we do, we use drones. The it's very helpful to have drone photography when we do our events. When I'm not doing events and I see a drone invading my space, it's very irritating. And I know that you guys have to just be aware of that with your product, that it's both something that's extremely useful, but also something that people are 
afraid of. And, you know, the other thing, too, in terms of the river, I mean, there are going to be a certain number of people that are intimidated by getting on the water if they see drones flying around. Um, but it's, you know, I I just it is hard to really kind of take, you know, it's you guys. This isn't you guys aren't a company that just came out of a garage. You know, you guys have a very qualified team of professionals and I'll, I'll give you, I can be open. I, I don't know. However this happened and however we're here, we're here, but you guys certainly are not unintelligent. Well, <laughs> thank you for that. And I appreciate your willingness to engage. I would, um, Sylvia, if we have time, I'll, I, I want to be respectful of time, but, but I, I would like X to talk a little bit about, um, the economic development, the jobs, and the industrial land in terms of the site at North Portland uh, to some of um, Willie's comments around the land itself and the, My life. and the effort that we're making there around um, economic development and um, the restoration on the land. You know, before we go there, I just want to see, Scott, um, if you had any responses as well. You know, I, I want to thank Willie for his comments. There have been some really good comments that we've heard. Um, it, it is it is worth repeating that uh, this is uh, this is uh, not an approved lease or use, and we are uh, very much open and taking lots of notes on some very good comments uh, that we will make sure we're considering on any path forward. Thank you, Willie, and and others for your comments. And Elizabeth. Yeah, I. I, I want to let X speak, but I also just want to say there's some com there's some comments, questions in the chat that I want to be able to bring forward. So I just want to call that out. Great, go uh, go forward then. That's fine. Yeah. Me or will me or X? Oh, sorry. I uh, we're we are here to listen. So if we have lots of comments, then we should absolutely get them out and get them discussed. Okay. So I think there's a there's a few more. Um, one is uh, very specific. Are the port or either the port or Verizon getting a tax break, specifically economic um, opportunity taxes? Can someone just answer that quickly if that's possible? I'll speak on the Port of Portland's behalf. We are a public agency, so no. Great. Skyward, do you want to talk about whether you're pursuing anything with the city? We are not. OK, and then there's a couple of questions about um, regarding safety. How far can drones go astray? What is the range of the transmissions? Um, a couple specifically regarding birds. Are there migratory birds on the land that would be leased? And will this operation impact migratory birds? Um, and then there's an, a question that's come up a couple of times around the definition of commercial and whether or not law enforcement can be included in commercial. So I think those are mostly geared towards Skyward. X, do you want to take some of the safety yeah. and operational questions on that? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, on on the safety side, the the, the primary benefit of the river site is for to be able to observe the drone throughout its fly path. So it's not that we anticipate that drones at this at this site are drones that are at, the, at are at like at the very experimental or early set of maturity, right? These are uh, some of these partners have part. I don't have the statistic in front of me that they're 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 drones that have millions of hours on them. Uh, so by the time they get to the site, we're not really looking to to ascertain the aircraft safety. Hopefully that's been proven to us by, by the manufacturer. Um, the FAA is very much a safety focused organization. Uh, aviation is very much a, a safety focused culture. And uh, obviously it's important for us, uh, for the drones to be reliable, for them to be good products for people that are doing things like doing aerial cinematography with them. Uh, so the, the, the beginning part is that there are rules from the FAA. Every flight we do is regulated. Every pilot is licensed. Every operation is planned. Every drone is, there's risk assessments. There's a whole safety management. When I talked earlier about uh, the fact that it's about like seven hours of preparation to one hour flight, that that's the reason why is because there's just about a lot of analysis that happens. 
throughout the process. And uh, the website has uh, has more details on that. And I think that might be something for the for the follow on sessions that we can go into detail about where the FAA puts different um, levels of safety for different types of uh, of operations. Um, that's continuing to evolve, especially in the commercial space. Right, our clients are looking for reliable drones. They're they're companies that that um, that is important to them to have safe equipment. So the FAA has programs like a program called Durability and Reliability that has that requires hundreds, if not thousands, of hours for cert for drones before they can go into these use cases. So the point is, there's a progression based on how big the aircraft is, how much it weighs, how far it's going. Uh, that puts different safety checks. And we look at that prior to every drone, prior to every operation. We have uh, we have testing that happens in other facilities and we have partners that do that testing for us before they, they get to somebody like myself. Um, I know there's specific questions about um, both on the wildlife side and on the on, on, on potential non-participants along the flight route and along the communications. Uh, the communications, um, you know, obviously there, there, there's, there's, uh, there's some things that are short range. Most drones are that way today. Uh, what we're trying to do is add cellular to them because uh, there's more coverage there. If there's, if, if you drop your control on your current drone, that's it. Uh, there's no backup. If, if something happens with it on a cellular drone, it can go to another tower and reestablish its communications. Uh, in, avia uh, in aviation, has got certain standards. There's standards that we work on that we can talk about in the detailed sessions about how long we can go without communications. Losing communications doesn't mean that necessarily there's actually anything abnormal. The jet airliners that, that we fly on when they go overseas sometimes can be without communications by their standards for, for minutes, if not uh, for seconds, if not minutes. In any case, we look at all that, we do the assessment. The, the, the reason that the, that the river provides a, a, a good place for operations is once we have drones that we feel are a certain reliability standard to do longer flights to see how, they're, how they perform. If anything happens during these interim flights, we ground the aircraft, we look at it, we talk to the manufacturers and try to make an assessment. Uh, we've seen that these aircraft are on, compared to some of the some of the aircraft that are certified to fly people right now, passengers on board are about uh, 230 times <laughs> more reliable uh, that, than those that, you, you know. Uh, so a lot of information, uh, so I wanna keep it kind of high level. Uh, but specifically on the, on the river, part of that is to, to supplement with a boat so we can see who's on the river, see, uh, try to make an assessment. I, I know we're working with various subject matter experts on trying to understand how to do that with the, with the birds and take that into account. But same thing to, for other users of the river, uh, to be able to talk between the boat and the pilot to say, there's a person here, we need to change the flight route or we can't take off or we want to delay until there's, until there's a situation that's, that's amenable to, uh, to, to the operation. So that's, that's the, the, the high level. And I'll stop there. Um, I think I got the, the questions, but if I miss something, please let me know. Hey, X, I don't want to lose sight of, of Willie's question also about are you aware, or Mariah as well, about uh, other drone testing uh, locations over water? Oh, thank you, Scott. Yeah, sorry about that, Willie. Um, there, yeah, we are aware of a few uh, companies that, that do this largely for the same reasons. Um, uh, you know, it's this is still a, a nascent industry and pretty small, so it's hard to get a lot of um, information about what everybody else is doing. Um, uh, so it's uh, at least with one of the partners that we're working on on one project. Yeah, we we mentioned that that was an area that we're looking at. They said that they were doing something similar. So I know that's not a great sample of size, mm -hmm. Willie, but we, we're aware of some. Um, it's it's certainly more common on some of the more aerospace grade drones, which are bigger than what we'd be testing or doing here. Mm -hmm. Also, rivers have been used as an aviation corridor um, for many, many years for helicopters and um, for airplanes uh, for some of the same reasons that we're looking at them is that um, they tend to be less disruptive than flying over roads or flying over highly populated areas. Thank Can you. I offer a couple more questions from the chat? One yes, is. Please. There's still a couple more questions about the process and the timeline. And I think that, um, yes, knowing what we know now, we probably would have started engaging the community sooner on this. And while that, and that is correct, and um, it is also correct what Willie says is that we are not past the point of no return. Um, we are still in a moment where we can make a decision and nothing final has been determined. Um, so, so both things are, are true. Um, 
And then there's a couple really specific questions. Um, is um, Skyward testing hardware or software? Um, do you do pilot training? How big are the drones and is there an upper limit to size? How many staff will you hire and will you be hiring them locally? Um, and I think you may have touched on this, but are you considering other locations? And along with the are you training pilots? Um, there's a question about can amateur pilots fly in this space? And I think we're all caught up for now. Thank you, Sylvia. All right, Elizabeth, I'm gonna need some help on the on the read back if I miss some of those. Um, amateur pilots, yes, the the um, the the city does have rules about recreational park flyers. And again, I don't want to give misinformation, but there are rules. I mean, I live in St. John's myself and have seen recreational flyers um, uh, routinely in, in Cathedral Park. Uh, so that's not really our focus. Our focus is commercial drones, which fall under different rules and require licensure. Uh, the, the recreational drones, yeah, those are pretty much uh, an individual that's flying recreationally has a lot more latitude in, in where they can fly and fly in a lot of different places in, in the city. Uh, without without the licensure. Um, so that was the amateur drones. Uh, yes, they can be flown in the same area. And I'm sorry if uh, the on the pilot training, uh, yes, we have both internal pilot training and we also do training for other organizations just on best practices, safety management systems, uh, kind of the, the, the whole gamut of, um, of, uh, of pilot training use cases. Um, on hardware and software, uh, back to Mariah's point, we're, we're largely testing the uh, software integration. There are places where we where we are testing some of the hardware seller integration. We are not a seller hardware manufacturer ourselves. This is similar to what happens with how cell phones get tested to make sure that they work and have the quality of service that you'd expect before they go into the market. Um, this is a good lead into the other question about are there other facilities? Yes. Uh, there are other facilities where we have the ability to do different testing and where we do current testing. Some of that testing happens indoors. Um, what what this site is uh, is intended to do is, is supplement that testing and put it closer to the engineering teams that are in downtown Portland, uh, provide access to jobs in in north in the North Portland area in this industrial zoning. Um, and there's a, there's a lot more we could say about that in terms of what we're trying to do there with. Uh, with uh, diversity and outreach, uh, but so that, I think that was hardware testing, pilot training, and uh, and the other question about uh, about how many uh, people will you be hiring, and where would they be from, and what is the size of the drones, and is there an upper limit? Okay, thank you. Um, the people that we're we're right now. Um, the core team is, is pretty small. It's like four or five people. The, there were routinely about 15 people involved. Um, the overall growth plan uh, before COVID, frankly, was uh, about uh, 20 to 30. Uh, our, our desire is to hire those folks from the, from the local community. We are one of the first signatories of the, of the Tech Town PDX diversity pledge. Of the, the, we're, we're fully committed to that, I think, of our, of our recent hires. Uh, every candidate was a, a every interview had a device candidate, and the majority of hires have been um, candidates from different backgrounds. Uh, so that's uh, so about five now, 15 routinely, helping to grow to a couple dozen over the years. If this site is is a site that's going to work, um, and yeah, our desire is to to work and diversify. I mean, the, the issue that that Willie brought up about uh, social justice and equity and hiring is very front of mind for us. Uh, we uh, we have another facility in in, in rural areas uh, that are closer to the area, but we we're Portland business and we want to do uh, we want to bring these jobs here. Uh, and sorry, there was one more Elizabeth. The size drones. of the drones and oh, size of the drones thing. Whether there's an upper limit. Yeah, size of the drones. The primary I would say right now in the market, there's primarily kind of two classes. There's these these small drones that are about two pounds, probably familiar to the ones that you might use for. Uh, cinematography, then that's really where, where a lot of folks are. Uh, after that, you get into kind of this medium class drone that are more 10 to 15 pounds. The regulatory upper limit without special permitting is about is 55 pounds. That requires going to the FAA, who's the regulator, and making the safety case that you can fly a drone that size. We have no drones that are uh, anywhere near close that size right now with any of our partners. The majority of them, I would say, are somewhere between 10 and, or sorry, between 2 and 15 pounds. 
OK, and there were two questions that people came back around to um, wanting more clarity on. One was um, when you define what commercial is, does that include law enforcement or can it include law enforcement security type purposes? Um, and then um, the other question was, what is the frequency of flight? How many drones for how long um, during the day? Uh, I can do the the, uh, the flight do the, one. How many drones and the how long? Yeah, I think we talked about that. Yeah, um, yeah. Thanks for that question. It, it's pretty much on the average operational day. It's about an hour, hour and a half, just because of the endurance of the drones, with about you know probably like five to six hours of prep time. Um, then and what what we've been trying to do there to just to in thinking about how that impacts the community is. Uh, to think about the noise to make sure that we're within the city's noise ordinances. Uh, you know, sometimes one drone might make more noise than two or three drones. So uh, we're looking at equipment that we can put to make sure that we're within the city, within the levels. We've hired a sonic consultant to help us understand that with the ambient uh, environment. But they're relatively low flight volume operations because they are for the purposes of testing uh, the, the the software. So uh, there are some use cases that that um, that are that uh might be up in the air a little longer but you know like we're here to listen and take that feedback back and saying hey maybe those are things that that make more sense somewhere else but uh right now this also there's some fa stuff about this that i i don't want to quote mis misquote but it says the same thing about throughout the industry most people do a handful of flights a week the flights are about an hour so that's kind of where the industry is as a whole thanks x and thanks, um, Elizabeth, for bringing those questions in. We know there are other questions in the chat that likely haven't been answered yet, um, but we're trying to kind of balance being able to bring comments into the room through the discussion and through the chat. So we'll bring in more of the chat questions a little bit later after we, we get through um, some other folks that have their hands raised here. So next in the queue, we have Leah, Mary, and then Bob Salinger. So Leah, why don't you go ahead? Thanks, Sylvia. Um, I just want to appreciate you for a second. You're doing a really great job of mediating this. Um, so thank you so much. Um, the first comment that I have is for Mariah um, when she continues to say we are a software company. Um, I sort of I guess I should have started with an introduction. My name is Leah Holland. I'm a North Portland resident, avid kayaker and avid runner in Cathedral Park, Forest Park and across the St. John's Bridge. Uh, this facility would affect my day-to-day -day life. Uh, I also am a digital rights advocate with the nonprofit organization Fight for the Future, which has a fraught history with Verizon. Um, and I found out about this program less than two weeks ago, even though it would be affecting my life every day. So first, Mariah, when you say that you are a software company, I find that to be the opposite of an excuse. Um, it's kind of an indictment of your operations, especially in this moment when software is tearing apart the fabric of our society all around us via social media and making us more divided than ever. There's never been a better moment to like really invest with your team in responsible software and in studying your impact that's essential to a healthy and sustainable and equitable future. And I'm really glad that you're having these conversations now. So thank you for that. Um, and then I wanted to address a couple of questions that came up earlier. First, why facial recognition is a part of this conversation. Um, the Port of Portland really broke with the city uh, during the hearings for uh, our during the process when the city was deciding to ban facial recognition for commercial and public um, and private for public and private use. Uh, Emerald wrote a recommendation from the Port of Portland asking for an exception that would have allowed Delta and other airlines to collude with Customs and Border Protection to provide video feeds into their facial recognition database, um, something that the Port of Seattle actually gave uh, to Customs and Border Protection, but thankfully our city commissioners did not. Um, this technology here is also very nascent um, and is akin to facial recognition in terms of its uh, potential for surveillance and oppression. And I'm not encouraged, and other local activists are also not encouraged by the port's lack of cohesion for our city and our elected officials um, when it comes to surveillance, like our, our citizenry, especially after surveillance drones have been flown over us protesting or in a really different place 
than the port on these technologies. So that's a big part of why facial recognition is part of this conversation. Um, next is military, and I do have a question on this one. So the why is military use a part of this conversation? Uh, and that is a really great question. Uh, I really do find this drones for good framing problematic because as we see with all nascent technologies, mission creep is inevitable here. And even X acknowledged this, you know, when he was talking about night flights using the word currently, because the goal of this technology or of this facility is to improve the technology. And as the technology improves, the use cases improve and there's more ability to, to make money on a variety of different uh, potentials. So uh, Verizon is currently testing 5G capacity for drones with the Marines as recently as July 22nd of this year. Uh, and that sounds like the exact same technology that was pro that's proposed here. Um, and Ver Toma is also correct. Verizon does have a stark history of privacy violations. And then uh, my question. On September 15th, Skyward put out a press release celebrating a testing partnership on Parrot Anafi drones. And in the first paragraph, there was a specific um, point in bold that these drones are only one of five approved by the US Department of Defense. And that included a source link. It was the most prominent part of the introduction of this new partnership with Parrot. Uh, you have since updated that press release to remove this language and to sort of clarify and remix that um, this is not a military partnership. Uh, I'm curious if you were able to share the original language of your press release with us so that we can reference that accurately and provide it to media to show that um, you know we were talking about that, uh, and that is why military is a part of this conversation because you yourselves were championing it as early as, as late as September 15th of this year. Uh, and then why are police, and then police use, and is police part of use, part of commercial activity? The answer to this is yes, and that's why they keep avoiding answering the question. Police use third party vendors just like any other company to provide surveillance technologies. And the results of this testing or also the direct application of this testing could easily be for law enforcement or for third party vendors that provide testing to law enforcement. So that's an important point to consider as we um, continue these conversations that law enforcement testing would definitely be a part of a commercial use case. Uh, and then finally, if Skyward is uh, sort of rankled by these assertions, I would really ask the Port of Portland, what regulations or restrictions, if any, are there on drones in Portland in this type of use case? And what limitations are there on this testing? From my understanding and speaking to local representatives, there's almost zero visibility into what ha would happen on this site, what is being tested, what is being done, and that should Skyward choose to test for the military or surveillance clients or law enforcement in the future, we would not know. Is that correct? Thank you. Thank you, Leah, and appreciate um, all of those comments and I th and the and the questions that came out there. And I, it sounds like maybe the direct questions that could could go to Mariah and then Scott are you know one on sort of this concern about over time there might be military use and the mission creep concern and a question about um, the police use and also the press release you you mentioned. And then I heard for the port just questions about what restrictions there could be on drones. So Mariah and Scott, maybe, and, and let's try to do quick responses if possible, because I know there are a lot of other folks that want to um, get their comments in today. Do you want to go first, yeah, Mariah? Uh, actually, yeah, actually, um, can I ask Jess uh, to talk a little bit about Parrot? Um, I think Jess is uh, actually closer to it. I want to make sure we're accurate in our response. Yes, definitely. Uh, thanks, Leah. Jess here, uh, Director of Marketing Communications for Skyward. Um, so the I think the blog that you're referencing on the Anafi partnership um, was with Parrot, and they are listed as a drone that can be used by the Department of Defense. The reason that we have a lot of that language in there is um, because that is really specifically around data transfer. Uh, so companies, especially enterprises that inspect critical infrastructure, which Verizon is one of those, along with um, some of our energy and utility companies, are really, really concerned about data transfer um, and potentially transfer of data um, outside of the U.S. And so a drone that is accepted or is listed as has acceptable kind of data transfer limits um, and can be accepted by the military is then more widely and, and safely accepted by commercial drone users that have concerns about their own data security, which in the drone industry um, is something that a lot of commercial users are are concerned about. 
Um, they want to make sure that they can trust that when they're capturing information with a drone, that that stays within their organization um, and with their company. So I can send you the original language of the blog. You're correct. We did update it today because we I think it was today. Um, we wanted to make sure that it was really clear that it wasn't a military partnership. Most of our blogs and our content are really written for that enterprise drone user. Um, and so understanding that this is something that was a drone that was secure enough um, for military application gives a lot of confidence to those that are going, okay, I want to go and do inspections. I don't want to trust that my data is safe. Great. And if I could ask a quick follow up to that, does Parrot, um, does Parrot then benefit from this research and integration that you're doing with 5G? Will they then take the testing that you're doing and apply it to all of their drone technology or to this drone specifically? I would probably ask X to speak to that. I think I understand your question. Um, mm -hmm. So you're asking, I, most of that would be on the like the Skyward side. I don't know, X, can you speak to that a little bit more on integration or Mariah? Yeah, I, I can take it. I think, uh, so our partnership with Parrot is uh, commercial in nature. Parrot has a separate uh, partnership, a separate deal with uh, the DOD for the use of that drone um, with the DOD that we aren't we aren't part of. Um, and as just mentioned, um, we really like the data security that the Parrot drone offers. Um, many drones are manufactured by Chinese companies, and there are a lot of concerns about whether that data that the drone is capturing is actually secure and is being kept inside the US and, and with the countries. And so it was very important to us to have a party who a partner who valued that data security uh, and keeping that information safe. So that's the that's the nature of the connection there. The the testing that Parrot um, is likely to be involved in with us is with regard to cellular connectivity and um, being able to securely connect that drone to the network um for extended flight and um beyond uh what you can do with a wi-fi connection so um that work could be used by parrot in drones in their in their drones generally um, we are not i, I want to be very clear about this we are not testing surveillance use cases with parrot or with any other customer um, we're not testing facial recognition i share uh the concerns and on both those technologies and those use cases. And um, I, I know a number of us at Skyward were really troubled by um, the surveillance drones and the concerns over the summer and over the last several months of what we what we saw uh, in the city of Portland. It's not um, a part of the industry that we wish to be associated with in any way. So I share those concerns and our drone testing facility is not involved in those surveillance or those facial recognition use cases or in enabling um, hardware manufacturers to, you know, to go and do that. Can you put that in a legally binding statement? I, I think we're certainly willing to look at what we um, at, at statements of, I think we talked about at one of the meetings about a good neighbor agreement um, that would outline, you know, more clearly what we plan to do there, certainly. And we have much of this information um, already uh, stated in public on our website as public statements. Thank you. And Scott, did you want to respond to any of the questions brought up as well? Um, I, I did see just uh, at least one that was lease focused. Um, there was a question about the term of, of the lease. Um, um, and that was the a five year term is what we were talking with, with some options to extend. But again, that that is the conceptual discussions we've been having about a lease. So it's not a final approval. All right. Thank you. And then let's go to Mary and then Bob. So go ahead. Go ahead, Mary. Okay, hi. Um, I just, I, I had made comments a while back and it wasn't, they weren't shared. So I just wanted to uh, make a clarification about how uh, the neighborhood, how the outreach was done. And it was really just the land use notification that was sent from the Bureau of Development Services, which is 
stand the standard process. Um, and uh, of course, I, you know, the NDA, that is not anything I would know about, but that's the standard process. It is not the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, it is Development Services. And these land use notices are sent to neighborhood district coalition offices, which is where I work for North Portland Neighborhood Services, which actually is part of the city of Portland. Um, and it was also sent to the Cathedral Park Neighborhood Association. So both of um, when that came out, then then it was shared, I believe, with uh, this larger community. So just to clarify that. Thanks for the clarification. And Bob, go ahead. Uh, good evening. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, I actually have two. I just want to get I appreciate your answering the question earlier about the number of flights, but I really want to nail this down because I, I still wasn't sure I got it exactly right. Um, is it one flight a day? I mean, is that actually the number? You're going to fly one drone for one hour, five days a week. Uh, so I want to understand that. And what is the flight path and the altitude that you'll be going at when you do that? So as much information as you can provide us in terms of uh trajectory and geography and and numbers would be appreciated the second question i have pertains to the peregrine falcons on the saint john's bridge um, they've been there for over 20 years uh one of the more productive nests in the state of oregon the most productive nest uh probably in, in the city of portland uh, along with the fremont bridge um my um opinion having monitored those birds for two decades is you cannot fly a drone safely in that geography uh, that would not put those birds at risk and that you really potentially only have one uh, opportunity to find out what that risk is you know when the bird hits the drone it's probably game over for the bird um this is a formerly listed species under the federal and state endangered species act um so i know you've hired consultants to look into this uh I want to understand what the expertise those consultants have uh, in terms of peregrine falcons specifically and what expertise they have about this site specifically as well. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Bob. Yeah, and I'll, maybe I'll, I'll start in reverse order um, if that's okay. Um, and it's, it's, it's good to meet you. I've seen some of the email exchanges from the from the from the consultancy mentioned uh my understanding is that um at least two of the folks of the three that have been retained are are were specifically because of their expertise in, in peregrines um i don't have their resumes in front of me but i'm sure we can get that information to provide to you i i, I think that uh that uh sorry there's a little side noise uh, I think that um, Mark is in Mark Martell and that group is in communication, so I can make a note to make sure to that they can provide that information. They provided it, but I don't have it in front of me. I think one of them was a peregrine specific falcon, and um, uh, the, the the PhD I believe has a similar background. Um, so I, I don't know that they've got they don't that they have specific uh, background in this pair, which is why they're looking to reach out and work with Portland Audubon to and you uh, to to get more information about that. Uh, you know, uh, we got the report from them a little about um, Tuesday of this week. So I'm still parsing through it. I'm not a subject matter expert in, in programs myself. So I'm just trying to parse it. Uh, but our intent really is to to have them work with you and Audubon and, and subject matter experts to really do an assessment so we can so we can uh, frankly look at this and see uh, what fly paths might be the ones that can that can work for the area. I mean, I think largely they've taken their analysis from uh, studies that were done by the Department of Transportation and building the St. John's Bridge, but um, I, I'd be speaking out of school with too much details about that since I'm just kind of the recipient of the report. Uh, based on that, I think what they're what they're looking at is uh, figuring out to develop monitoring strategies during the the, the breeding season, especially with the fledglings, uh, and seeing what we can do in terms of flight routes to that departure to the north. That's uh, I think outside in in those bands. Uh, the um, the, the questions that I have, and, and I'm not sure, and I don't know what the community has seen is, uh, like I said, anecdotally, I've seen a, a fair amount of, of recreational drone activity. I saw a video earlier this week on, on a Portland community site of somebody flying underneath the bridge and its stanchions. So um, I'm not 
particularly aware of what that interaction with is there. But what we're trying to do, Bob, is, is really uh, pair the subject matter experts with yourself so that we can look at it and see, is there uh, a viable path forward? In terms of the, the flight altitudes, really the, the intent is to depart uh, to the north and uh, to, to follow the shoreline up to, towards the mouth for these flights and to spend the minimal amount of time possible. Uh, there would be an approach coming back towards the bridge, obviously on the on the descent route, but there are some places either by decreasing the flight height or doing the pattern so that it comes in towards the east that might be able to mitigate some of those things. I mean, obviously we're balancing that with uh, with the noise and other considerations to try to figure out how how uh, we're gonna path forward. But what I can say is that it's very much an analysis where I read and try to understand every line of it. Uh, it like, um, like uh, the port has said, right? We're, we're still taking information as we get about this, about the historicity of the site to, to form our point of view. And um, it's not a foregone conclusion for us either on which way we're gonna go or what thing's gonna work for this facility for specific types of operations. Um, the, the frequencies, that seems to be where the frequencies are. I mean, fortunately, because these are, these are uh, we're not a commercial provider ourselves. We have more latitude in how we schedule our flying, where we fly, access to alternate locations. So we, we've got, um, you know, unlike somebody who's using this to film an event who has a set schedule, we've got the flexibility to try to do and monitor and, and work uh, with the various environmental factors to try to optimize the flight routes. So that's that's where we are, uh, and we're certainly encouraging and talking to those to that groups to engage with with you and other subject matter experts to continue the dialogue and and see and see what we discover. I appreciate the answer. I'll just say I, I did all those research uh, projects for ODOT. I was the principal biologist on the um, the research that they're using, so I'm very familiar with it. Um, and uh, it, it goes beyond the fledglings. It, it the birds are there, the adults are there year round, and so there's concern about the fledglings, but there's also concern just about the adults. In fact, there's more concern in my mind about the adults uh, hitting those drones. Uh, they are very very territorial. Uh, and peregrines and drones are not a good mix. So if you have drones coming out day after day out of the same facility in their nesting territory that they're on th throughout the entire year, uh, there's a good probability at some point they'll try and knock one out of the sky. So happy to keep talking with your biologist, but um, I, I have a hard time seeing how uh, that can be made safe in that immediate vicinity, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, thanks, Bob, and thanks, X, for the responses there. And I want to make sure that we can at least get through the hand, the new hands that we have up, um, Michelle Brinning and Cassie Cohen and Michael Pouncil, I believe. And then we'll see if we have time to also go through a few of the uh, chat comments that have come in and um, folks that have that have made comments earlier in today's meeting. So let's go to... Yeah. Oh, go Can ahead. I, sure. I, I apologize. Um, I posted a link to a comment form in the chat and I'll keep posting it so that um, if if we run out of time, but I think we can continue to talk that you can also put any comments or questions you have in that and they'll get responded to as well. Yes, thank you for that. That's a good point. There are a lot of questions and a lot of this will get responded to in writing um, after today's meeting. So filling out the comment form and providing questions there or through this chat, um, we'll try to get those answered afterwards. So let's go to Michelle Brinning. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. So I, um, hi, I'm Michelle. I've lived in St. John's. I've been a homeowner since 2006, and I am the land use chair for the St. John's Neighborhood Association. Um, but my comment is my own, and um, I would like to comment that um, the 32,000 people who live in this neighborhood comprise one of the most racially diverse neighborhoods in the city of Portland. 40% um, of our residents are non-white, they're black indigenous people of color. And one of our fellow citizens earlier mentioned the fact that a project like this wouldn't obviously be attempted in West Lynn or the West Hills. And there is no doubt to anyone who lives in this neighborhood that having drones fly by all, all hours of the day and night, um, trying to enjoy a picnic at Cathedral Park when drones are flying by, this would have a very profound 
negative impact on our quality of life in this neighborhood. And the fact that this neighborhood is so racially diverse and so non-white in comparison to the rest of Portland, I think it's really a shame. And I think it's quite obvious that that's why this neighborhood is being targeted. And that's my comment. Thank you, Michelle, appreciate that comment. Um, Cassie Cohen. Good evening, uh, my name is Cassie Cohen. I'm with the Portland Harbor Community Coalition. I, um, you know, I am not representing my entire coalition or our coalition tonight because I have not had the time to check in with each of the 40 plus organizations or individuals that are part of our organization. This this has kind of been steamrolling so fast, this 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 issue. And we have been hearing so many. I guess what I wanted to say is that we have only heard concerns in the community so far. And I want that to settle in for the port and for Skyward and Verizon tonight because, you know, I wish that it could be different. I wish that you all could, uh, you know, leave this, uh, this conversation tonight feeling like there's maybe a path forward uh, that could satisfy the community. Um, but I don't, I don't hear it, and um, I continue to not hear it. And you'll continue to hear uh, concerns, uh, many, many different concerns, um, environmental concerns, uh, people concerns, um, the impacts, the cumulative impacts on North Portland residents um, that continue to not be addressed um, are very real, and this. And folks see this as kind of one more negative impact that would uh, accumulate um, to to impact folks on the ground. So and in the river, for that matter. So unfortunately, you know, this is not going in in a positive direction. And I think any any uh, any attempt otherwise to uh, frame it uh, that you know that this is. Uh, going to work out and that the community will come around is not accurate uh, currently. So um, I, I just hope that you take folks seriously and, uh, you know, consider a different location. Uh, this, this site is not, should not be intended for drone testing facility. It should um, be a larger open-ended um, sort of transparent conversation with the community about how this site should be used, how it should be repurposed to benefit the community um, because there are so few um, access points to the river in the Portland Harbor Superfund zone specifically. Um, and that's kind of uh, something that our organization works on and, and we're struggling you know, and the port, and we work in good faith with the port, and we work in good faith with the city, and this is not, you know, this is not going the way that we would hope it would go. So thank you for listening tonight. We we hope you take everyone's uh, comments seriously, even if they haven't been uh, vocalized um, in, but are in the chat and, and otherwise, and you'll be continuing to hear from folks, I'm sure. So thank you. Thanks, Cassie. Really appreciate those thoughts and perspectives. And I'm just looking at Scott because it looked like you were going to put yourself off mute. OK, thank you. I know we want to hear from as many people as possible. So let's go to um, Michael Pouncil. Um, yes, uh, hear me? OK, can you hear me? OK. Um, <clears throat> Um, I just wanted to echo uh, a little bit what what Cassie had just said. Um, uh, that uh, you know, uh, I, I my name is Michael Pouncil. Um, I live in North in, Nor in North Portland, uh, and um, I also uh, uh, chair Portland Harbor Community Advisory Group. So we love bringing um, information uh, to our community here regarding Portland Harbor, and uh, this was a this was a real shocker. Um, but in echoing um, uh, Cassie's. Uh, um, 
what she just said, you know, this part of the city is inundated with so many, so many things uh, that uh, we have to uh, be concerned about, you know, uh, air quality, you know, the Portland Harbor Superfund site, um, you know, heavy commercial freight, you know, it, it kind of goes on and on. And, you know, having drones flying around our, in our community is definitely not um, something we want. And, and this isn't about nimbyism. This is not about not in our backyard. Um, we really don't want this to be anywhere where Portlanders have to be uh, concerned about uh, uh, drones flying um, in their community. This should be in a low population, low dense area and not in an urban environment. But my question I have is one, one is a, a clarifying question, which is um, uh, does a uh, uh, parrot uh, provide um, a tech uh, for military, for the military or for the DOD, do they work in conjunction with them is my first question. And then, or my clarifying question, because I, I, I wasn't quite sure what, what you said on that. And then my second question is, um, is Skyward um, making improvements across Parrot's product line? So are you making improvements to the tools that Parrot actually, to their tools? Um, but yeah, so that's, those are kind of my two, my clarifying question and the question. And, and thanks again for hearing community voices. Uh, um, we wish that this was happening a lot sooner, but it's better, better now than never. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so Mariah? Yeah, I can take the parrot question and then um, it, it might be helpful um, if we have time to just have uh, X comment a bit on the on the uh, jobs investment and in North Portland and in this site, just a counterpoint um, on the parrot side. Uh, so, so the drone that uh, we will be selling and um, working with for commercial uses. Uh, the Anafi USA is uh, also so different configuration of software um, to the DOD in a partnership that Parrot has that we are not a part of. Um, our uh, software, which is used for uh, operations management, so for keeping track of your flights and where it's safe to fly, and if, the if your pilots are licensed, and um, if the drone is airworthy and safe to fly, that that software is used with this enough in the commercial uh, commercial configuration, if that makes sense. So the testing that we are doing with the Parrot drone uh, is with regard to connectivity, so cellular using cellular with the drone so that you could fly the drone for longer uh, distances or so that you could transfer data back securely over cellular. Um, that Those kind of, of testing use cases. That uh, cellular connectivity could be used by Parrot on the, because the, it's uh, the same drone. They could be used by Parrot and be um, sold by them into their DOD partnership, but we aren't we aren't part of that or testing or involved in any of that, and um, we aren't involved, as I said, in any of the use cases that they might be that Parrot might be testing or using with the DOD. That's a uh, completely separate arrangement or agreement that I I I don't have insider involvement. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, it, it, it does. Um, uh, but it, it, you know, I, I think this is one of the things that community is concerned about is this whole creep, you know, this creep that happens with with technology and our security. And, you know, um, you know, we realize that you may not have, you know, you know, uh, um, Skyward, you know, may not have anything to do with that, but your technology does and it impacts, you know, um, the rest of the community. And we really don't we really don't want Portland to be a base of this area that could 
this technology could be used other places. I mean, we are an international community here. We have loved ones and friends all over the world, and we don't want it coming from Portland. Um, uh, you know, uh, this. So yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate your 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 answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Michael and Mariah. Um, and let's go to Mary Nolan and then quickly to um, Toma and Matt for some final comments. And then we'll see if we can get into our wrap up. We want to respect people's time. We said the meeting went till eight, so we, you know, we don't want to go too far over um, to respect people's time. So Mary, go ahead. Thanks. I have very specific questions, one for the port and one for Skyward. For the port, what date or week do you expect to sign a final lease on your PERT chart or your Gantt chart? Where do you anticipate that happening? And then for um, Skyward, are you putting all your eggs in this basket or do you have active discussions going on for other sites where you could do this work? Uh, so um, I will answer for the port. Uh, Mary, thank you for your question. Um, we um, we are still, um, we have not a set a date because we are still actively in discussions and tonight we're specifically looking for comments that will help make us an in, help us make an informed decision about any path forward to a lease or not to a lease. So we don't have, uh, we have not scheduled it because we are, we're engaged in this community uh, informational session to make an informed decision. And I think I can speak to follow up if I might, Scott. Uh -huh. How many additional community conversations do you have planned? I can uh, I can tell you that this one uh, the port uh, felt was appropriate. So we work with Skyward to uh, set today's meeting and we understand they have multiple other follow ons. And it's it's okay. not so much uh, a schedule. It's we need to see that effective uh, uh, community engagement happen uh, before we talk about next steps. Uh, if next steps are towards uh, proposal of a lease. Okay. Thanks. Now, Mariah. Uh, yeah, ex were you going to talk? I can talk about the facilities, or you can talk about it. Which? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, yeah, thanks for the question, Mary. Um, yeah, we, we certainly have alternatives and and we are listening to especially the things that, that you're saying, Michael. I mean, um, it, it there we have a lot of discussions internally about many of these things. Right. Uh, I, I know, um, Matt, you mentioned that I was military. I was military, but I left as a conscientious objector. Right. This is like we we honestly uh, it's it's not a done deal for us either. We're looking at it and analyzing it and we want to be. Uh, and we want to hear and reflect like we're trying to do on many of the other issues. Uh, what I can tell specifically with the site and the history of it, right, is that we did as you would do in a standard property search. We said, hey, here's the requirements we have. Here's the constraints. Here's the needs. The realtors went and looked at what was available in the properties that were available. Uh, some of those were closer to downtown. Uh, uh, some of those were, were further away. So it was a balancing act of the of the employees commute, the the really wanting to bring these jobs and some of the, so, you know, we, we, we spent a lot of, you know, we spent a lot of time and energy on doing a low impact design that's trailers that don't leave a footprint that can be moved. So um, we, that, that was kind of the initial process for finding the site saying, hey, what's out there? And this one seemed to be a natural fit. The Portland, uh, the Port of Portland's aviation mission, the, the their professional administration of the airports, their understanding of flight safety, they manage the noise program for the FAA and have those sensors made it seems makes it seem to us a natural partnership. Uh, so that's how we went through this process and the analysis that's brought us to where we are today. Uh, there's other sites and other locations and other populations that are interested in the facility and are interested in bringing this capability here. I mean, for me, it's very personal, right? Like I was before I was here in this capacity, I was a small business owner with like 100% LGBTQIA2S staff, right? 
Um, I've seen what took me a year and million dollars of training paid for by the government. I was able to train this person to take, to have an aviation career in a few weeks. So, um, we, 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 we are hoping to do that engagement. We're, we're re we've reached out to various BIPOC groups. We're reaching out to the, the tribal elders. We're, we're talking to some of our own, uh, some of the own, some of our own folks about the recognition. Uh, but there, so there's a whole lot of factors that have brought it into the site. If it's just the mechanics of, can we do this somewhere else? Can we, can, can the jobs happen somewhere else? Can we look at putting it in a different community? Uh, can we put it in a rural community? Yeah, those are things that, that we can do, but we'll, what we really are trying to do is create more job opportunities for that, specifically for that diverse workforce. Um, and, and that's kind of, that's kind of where, where, where we are. Uh, so um, it, I, hopefully, I don't know if that answers all of your question, Mary, but I, I know that was a little bit uh, here and there. Yeah, thanks, X, and thanks, Mary, for the questions. And um, just for those that do have to leave right at eight, I want to make another plug for the comment form. And Elizabeth, if you want to put that in the chat one more time, um, if folks have additional questions or comments that weren't answered here, we know a lot of the questions were not answered because there's just so many of them to get through in two in uh, two hours. But um, you can use that comment form to provide your information and your questions for for um, being answered later after today's meeting. And let's see, let's um, quickly hear again from Toma and then Matt. All right, thanks uh, for your time. Um, so um, I have some remaining questions. First, um, I don't know why Mar Mariah can't tell us that she can sign a legally binding statement to back up her statements that this drone testing will not be in any way connecting to military technologies or surveillance technologies, um, policing technologies. Um, so I think Mariah should stop telling us that this drone facility will have no connection to these toxic industries um, until she can hand us a legally binding statement. And without that legally binding statement, her words are a waste of time because there is, there is every, everyone knows that Verizon has been breaching our security. There's a long history of it. Our Senator Wyden just addressed it recently. Verizon selling third world, third party um, companies our location information, okay? Um, so, okay, so um, also um, what I have to say um, are the impacts to the BIPOC community cannot be ignored. We know that surveillance and facial recognition is primarily targeted the BIPOC people, brown and black people, and therefore this drone facility should be the least should be denied absolutely is making members of the BIPOC community in Portland very nervous okay um, and I have a question and I'd like to know which tribal elders have you talked to about this drone facility I need to know names and tribes there needs to be transparency with this okay so I need to hear back about that okay Another question, and this is very, very important. Matt Stein, thank you, Matt, for disclosing this information. It appears that there is a conflict of interest with the Port of Portland. Elizabeth Kennedy Wong's husband, it works for Verizon's lobbying firm, SJ3. And I spoke to a lawyer friend of mine recently who said that that's obviously a severe conflict of interest. So I think there should be an investigation launched into this conflict of interest and we need answers because this whole conversation has been about lack of transparency with the community and not just me, but other people have been talking about a cover up. Okay, so we need answers now because this is a, it's a big conflict of interest and this t speaks a lot about some of this issue with transparency we've been having. Thank you. And um, again, I would like to reiterate that I'm asking the Port of Portland to deny the lease for Skyward, please. Thank you. Thank you, Toma. Appreciate those comments and questions. Um, 
And then Matt and then Hugh and likely, you know, questions will probably be answered after this meeting in the interest of time, but we want to get them on the table. So Matt, go ahead. And we don't hear you. There we go. Let's, okay. Yep. All right. I think one of the one of the biggest questions that a lot of us in the community have is why this particular place. Um, I asked the question of Jess in an email. You know, proximity to their other location here in St. John's, um, uh, the uh, industri heavy industrial use. I think X mentioned some things, um, but uh, uh, you know, knowing that the the deal is not done, the lease is not signed, um, but it's quite evident that Verizon believes it's a done deal. They've uh, spent uh, a lot of money already on legal uh, work. They've brought in electrical service to the site. They undergrounded fiber optic at least at half a mile, maybe a mile of it from Lombard all the way to the site. Um, they've spent a lot of money on surveying and, and uh, permitting uh, permit applications for the road improvement they need to do as well as for the site use. So they've been proceeding as if it's a done deal. Um, hopefully the rest of us uh, can bring them around to uh, accepting that that might not be the case. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. And Hugh. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I was wondering, uh, you know, if I could ask this question to the Port of Portland. So, this very land that you're trying to offer to Skywood, have you ever thought of having a homeless camp over there? As you might know, the area around this whole um, section of Portland has seen a stark increase in homelessness. People are camping out in the streets. We have uh, feces, we have trash, we have camps all over the streets. The neighbors all around this area is suffering. So are the, uh, the campers. And right there itself, you got a, a big piece of land for which you could actually put in a homeless camp. Have you ever thought of that land being a homeless camp uh, for people to you know, stay there temporarily? So, um, Hugh, Scott Kilgo, thank you for your question. Um, I can tell you I uh, have not been a part of conversations about using that parcel for a homeless, uh, uh, homeless accommodations, but I can tell you it has, um, it's, it is zoned industrial and it has, um, it has a, uh, a complex sit, uh, set of constraints that make it hard to develop, which is one of the reasons that it has sat un undeveloped for 13 years. Thanks, Hugh, for the question and Scott for the response. And we really appreciate everyone's um, comments and perspectives today and, um, and for staying for a few minutes longer here. So I'll turn it over to Scott to just wrap us up with some um, next steps as well as to Mariah. So Scott, go ahead. Sure, uh, thank you very much for participating tonight. Um, I'm glad that uh, we had this initial listening session that the port has set up and worked with uh, Skyward. Um, I know that Mariah has some additional follow on uh, engagement to talk about, uh, but just as just as a reminder, the port will take we will work through uh, the questions that uh, maybe didn't get addressed and respond um, with follow up. If you responded through the link for the survey in the chat that Elizabeth has brought up a few times, that means we we certainly have your contact information so we can answer questions that maybe got missed during the meeting. Um, a decision has not been made. Uh, we've got a lot of information, a lot of concerns that we need to work through tonight. Uh, so we are not in any hurry uh, to hurry this process to make an informed decision. So that's uh, Mariah, do you have anything else to, to close with? Well, I just want to echo Scott's comments and thanking everyone uh, for coming tonight and uh, really appreciate uh, hearing from everyone and the chance to uh, speak directly and share information uh, about uh, the proposed facility and appreciate the feedback. Madam Jones! We've got uh, follow-ups planned. We will, uh, as uh, Scott mentioned, as I mentioned at the top of the meeting, we will be scheduling additional listening sessions and we'll get that information out to folks uh, over the next month we'll do several sessions we want to make sure that we have an opportunity to hear from everyone and to be able to respond um, so thank you all for your participation and for engaging uh, the process i appreciate it
Thank you. Rise and lies. I'd just like to extend the invitation for you folks, uh, the Port and Skyward folks, to join us on Sunday at uh, 3 o'clock at Cathedral Park. Um, you'll be able to hear it from a lot more of the community members. Thanks. Starting at noon. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, you're right. Noon o'clock. Noon. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Good night, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting.